quickly introduce the lab uh, so that people know who we are. So yeah, so I'm Benedict, um, I'm uh, uh, in BME and um, uh, with a bunch of, uh, you know, with David Hauser, uh, myself, um, research scientists in the lab, engineers, uh, program managers, grad students, postdocs, undergrads, um, we uh, run the computational genomics lab and platform groups. Uh, these are kind of sort of uh, twin ventures uh, that do that both, if I click to the next slide, both build infrastructure for lots of uh, big uh, projects, like uh, I just sort of threw some logos in here, uh, the Human Cell Atlas uh, project, which is a project to catalog uh, all the different cell types and states in the human body. Uh, you know, uh, also uh, big NIH projects for their cloud computing, like uh, this is the NHLBI cloud effort, uh, and this is the NHGRI cloud effort, uh, projects to uh, catalog uh, hereditary uh, cancer mutations specifically in BRCA1 and 2, but actually now in, in other genes as well. Uh, we do lots of work with GenCode. Uh, we do, and then we do lots and lots of interesting research work. So if you're interested in the lab, um, I'm going to talk about one topic today, but if you're interested in the lab, just send me an email, um, uh, hit up the website. Um, we, you know, we take undergraduates for internships and we are taking rotation students. Okay, so did that work? Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, this topic, pangenomics. Um, and actually there's a sort of, you know, uh, to, to understand where we are now in the field, it's worth looking back 20 years ago at the publication of the initial human reference genome. So uh, if, you, if you're in genomics, you will at some point uh, definitely uh, end up explicitly or implicitly using the human reference genome. We're now at uh, GRCH38, that's its uh, kind of code name. Um, and it really is the kind of cornerstone of, of, of human genomics, right? Um, it, it's the cornerstone because it acts like a proxy to a universal coordinate system for human genetics. So when we talk about genes, when we talk about, uh, you know, enhancers, when we talk about uh, regions, we generally use coordinates that are on our reference genome. And typically today uh, upon GLCH38 or the previous version 37. Um, it's also worth thinking about the history of this. Um, it took an act of Congress and uh, $3 billion on the US side uh, to, to create the initial reference genome. Uh, it was released in 2001, uh, you know, initially put on the internet by Jim Kent and David Hauser here at UC Santa Cruz, and it has been refined over the last 20 years. Um, so th yeah, that was a landmark. So where are we today? Well, one thing to bear in mind is that it's, it's still an incomplete sequence. Um, and uh, that is that in some parts of the sequence, um, it is unresolved, there are ends, there are gaps, and just a sequence of amb ambiguous characters. Uh, you know, essentially, we don't know what fits in this sequence. Uh, and um, all told that, depending on how you count it, it the, the sequence that is not fully resolved is about five to 8% uh, of, of the sequence. So relatively recently, um, just this last year, Karen Meager, who is a research scientist here, here at UC Santa Cruz in the lab, uh, and Alan Philippi at NHGRI, and a whole consortium of people, um, you know, uh, created a landmark uh, achievement by creating the first telomere to telomere. So that is a complete, from one tip to the other tip, sequence of a complete uh, haploid human chromosome, so uh, chromosome X, right? And that uh, was recently published uh, in Nature, really, uh, really big deal. Um, and just about a month ago, that group, the Telomere to Telomere Consortium, released a complete draft haploid. So that's one copy of each chromosome, not, not diploid like you'd have in a typical cell, but haploid, a complete draft of this uh, CHM13 uh, cell line. Uh, they've released that Telomere to Telomere in draft form, which is a huge landmark. So 20 years on, we finally have what is basically a complete haploid human genome. So huge, huge deal. Um, and that's, you know, that had came about because over the last 20 years, but in particular over the last five years, we've seen, a, you know, a, a sort of acceleration, constant, this exponential I I improvement in sequencing technologies, which are leading to really, really big gains in our ability to uh, characterize complicated regions of a genome or a transcriptome. So, you know, I just referenced a few papers here, just pulling them together. These are all sort of published over the last year. But, um, you know, the, the bottom line here is that, uh, you know, we now have reads that are at 
you know, depending on the technology, 20, 30,000 bases with an error only less than one every 100 bases. Um, so, you know, 99% accurate across 30,000 bases. Uh, and on the other end of the extreme, we have noisier reads for the nanopore sequencing technology, which can be a mega basin length, uh, but with an error perhaps about every 10 or so bases. And that, those sequencing technologies, so-called third generation sequencing technologies, are allowing us uh, to create these extremely uh, high quality genome assemblies, both uh, much more quickly and cheaply than previously, um, uh, and actually just much more accurately than we could achieve before. But, you know, um, so going back to this sort of this notion of the reference genome, um, the reason that, uh, you know, now we have this power to go and sequence, uh, it's worth bearing thinking about what, what kind of genetic characterization we've done in the field uh, to date. So this is, a, this is an interesting plot. I took from a, this actually Karen's slide, but she took from a recent paper, which shows, uh, you know, broadly, if you break down uh, the po human population uh, into, you know, crudely into large uh, you know, subpopulations at European, East Asian, et cetera, right, you can see that just the general distribution in terms of sizes of, of the human population over here on the right with this stack bar plot. And over here on the left, you can see um, in terms of people who have contributed thus far to genome-wide association studies, which are kind of genetic characterization using uh, these SNP chips uh, generally, are right, people who contributed, you can see that this is massive disproportionate number of European essentially characterization that has taken place thus far. And thus the vast majority of genomic studies thus far have focused, focused on Europeans and to a lesser extent East Asians, right? With a tiny fraction of samples coming from, for example, Africa, where we know from a population genetics point of view, most of the diversity exists. And so we're at this point whereby, you know, we've had a very high quality reference genome for a long time, and now we're able to characterize genomes more cheaply and more completely than ever before. And yet we still have this kind of, you know, uh, issue, a uh, gap, uh, where we just haven't sequenced the diversity of, of human populations that are out there. And so um, this cues up what I wanted to talk about today, which is this, uh, the Human Pan-Genome Reference Consortium. So this is a, a recently funded uh, National Human Genome Research uh, Institute project to build 350 ultimately telomere to telomere, so complete uh, public genome assemblies and make them available essentially to replace that one reference genome with a cohort of diverse uh, genomes. These are genomes that are being sampled from a diverse set of, po of populations uh, across the world or individuals with diverse genetic ancestry, I should say. Um, so that we can have a much, much better understanding in terms of our reference of what human diversity looks like. And what I'm going to talk about, because I'm a computational person, is how we're going to combine 350 separate uh, human genomes, diploid human genomes, so in actual fact, 750, uh, 700, I should say, haploid human genomes into a, into a, you know, a combined human pan genome, something that represents not just one, body, one person sequence, but actually, you know, a whole uh, population's uh, uh, diversity. So, um, so why does that matter? So, you know, uh, concretely, what's, what's, how do we sort of think about variation in, in the human population? Well, I'm going to show you how we think about how we gather variations in, uh, in a second. But right now, uh, if you take your genome and compare it, your diploid genome, and compare it to that reference haploid genome, you'll find about 5 million uh, single nucleotide variations, right, in your genome. So that you have, you know, your haploid genome is about 3 billion bases. You've got 6 billion bases of DNA per cell because it's diploid. And you'll find about 5 million single nucleotide variations uh, in there, right? That's about one every thousand or so uh, bases of, of haploid DNA. And then there are about uh, much fewer in terms of total number of variations, but in terms of total number of bases, about 20 million bases of DNA in your genome that are not present in the reference in, this, in, in that haploid reference in the same form. And they mostly take the form of uh, larger insertions and deletions, small insertions and deletions, but also larger insertions and deletions, uh, transpositions, inversions, et cetera, right? Copy number variations. And it's this class, this class of uh, large class in terms of total number of bases that we're really, really focused on because, um, and this is the need for the, the slightly ugly slide now, because today when we uh, want to cheaply assay the variations that are present in a new genome, right? We don't assemble that genome de novo 
because that costs a lot of money right now. Um, you know, we're talking about you know, 10, $20,000. If we want to do it uh, cheaply, if we want to be less than $1,000, what we do is we take, we take the sample, we prep it and run it on an aluminum machine where the reeds are going to be order 150 base pairs long. And we align them, we map them to that reference genome. So essentially finding where that sequence came from in terms of you know, the reference, right? And then we call the differences, the places where there's a difference uh, that's sort of uh, repeated um, across all of the uh, you know, duplicated sequences that we sample, right? That are present, that are different from the reference. So here, this is an IGV uh, screenshot. Uh, the, the reads are shown as these little gray bars. Uh, and you can see here that there's a gap in the reeds at this location that corresponds, there's a little bit of wobble because there's some noise in the reeds, um, but this gap corresponds to a homozygous deletion with respect to the reference. That means that that person's genome in both their copies has lost uh, how many base pairs of DNA, I guess two bases of DNA at that location. So that's how we characterize variations. Um, so you can see that if a variant is a single, you know, say if it's a base substitution, like an A to a T or a small uh, SNP, and if it's in a region where we can map the reads uh, with confidence, then this is a pretty good heuristic. This is a good way of finding out variations. The problem is that there are many, many, many variations that um, in terms of total number of bases. So this is a log log plot. You've got a log scale here in terms of uh, the number of, 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 of variations. And here, these are the sizes of the variations. This is on this side are insertions, on this side are deletions. So it's log log. And you can see that actually, uh, in terms of numbers of bases, there are more bases in large, relatively few events, but more bases uh, in these larger variations than there are in the smaller variations uh, combined. And as a result, uh, when you try to map those reads, so you imagine a read that's got a hundred base pair insertion in it, well, most of the read is taken up with the inserted sequence. So you can't map it to the reference. So you can never find that variation. And so in order to sort of fix that problem, what we need to do is build a reference that actually has information about that insertion, right? Because most of the variations that we have in our genomes are shared, they're common and shared between individuals. And so if we've already got knowledge about that variation, we can put it into our reference structure so that when we are trying to find out what variants are present in your sample or a new sample, um, we already know what to expect and therefore we're in a much better position to call that variation, okay? Um, and this goes all the way from sort of, you know, variants at a level of 100, 200 bases up to uh, alleles that are you know, truly dramatic. Like for example, here is a massive expansion uh, of uh, a centromeric uh, uh, alpha satellite uh, repeat um, between, between two alleles, right? We want to be able to characterize at this, this level. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Well, the vision uh, of, of, the, of the Human Pangenome Project is, is instead of having a linear sequence, right? So instead of having one haploid genome, we want to replace that with a graph, right? So, because if you imagine, right? If I take your genome and I take my genome and I smudge them together, I merge them together everywhere that they're the same sequence, and then I allow them to diverge where they are different, so sort of bifurcate where they are different, then I no longer have, from a sort of a data structure point of view, a string. Now I have a mathematical graph, right? With nodes and edges. Okay, and this is kind of illustrated in this picture here, where you can see the nodes, which are these rectangles, um, have you know have sequence associated with them, uh, and then where they diverge, you can see that I have you know multiple possibilities. So this would correspond to a SNP. You can either have the A or you can have the C, and these colored ribbons correspond to haplotypes, to actual pieces of DNA that thread through these nodes in order to spell out a sequence. So for example, you know, TGA, GAA, A, ACA, as opposed to C, right? A simple idea, um, but actually sufficient if we, if we build it to represent any kind of, of genetic variation, right? And so here you can see a SNP, over here, for example, you can see an indel where you can skip this node. So you can just not have this base, et cetera, right? So um, any questions at this point? Because we're going to go on from here. I'll just keep going. Okay, so, um, so why go this route, okay? Um, so this is an interesting paper um, that, oh, sorry, say my internet's unstable. Can you hear me okay? 
I'm going to assume yes. You're still you're still audible and visible. Okay, good. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> yes. Sorry, it keeps it keeps popping up and saying the internet's unstable, but I'll just carry on. So, um, so one solution to this uh, to this idea, and I want to kind of like sort of put it. I, I want to. I, I want you to, to not, not consider it further, um, would be to say, well, okay, right? So, you know, we all come from different parts of the world. Let's sequence these 350 uh, genomes, right? And then when I want to compare my genome, well, you know, I'm, I'm British, so I'll compare myself to the British reference genome, right? Uh, or, you know, my friend who's French, he'll compare himself to the French reference genome, right? Um, the problem with that is that really, um, their human population is not that neatly packaged, right? Our genetic structure is such that there has been gene flow that doesn't respect national or ethnic or any other boundary, right? Uh, there are people who are obviously, you know, uh, admixed recently, but we are all complex admixtures of ancestral populations. And so it's actually not possible for you to pick one genome. There are gonna be, you know, obviously, uh, who you have a member of your family that might be a better representation for, for at least half of your genome. Um, but in general, there's not going to be one reference genome that's going to be a better fit for you. And so actually, when we think about this, this, pro this thorny problem of how we kind of integrate information together, um, it's actually important to think about how we, we combine information. Um, so anyway, so just want to put that out there, that there is a whole sort of a part of this, which is thinking about how we think about, uh, you know, genetic diversity and structure and why we want to go down this route of an integrated reference as opposed to some sort of set of national references or what have you, which is something that people have proposed, but I think we're, we're, we're uh, trying to put to bed. It is worth remembering that between any two uh, human, sub, uh, human subpopulations, um, there's actually more variation in common between, uh, <coughs> between those subpopulations than you would find between two individuals within a given subpopulation. And that means that you know there's much more gene flow between so-called notions of subpopulations than there are between individuals. Um, so anyway, oh, what have I done? Oh dear, I think. Uh, stop it! This is going away. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Let me click back. Okay. All right. So let's just carry on. So. Um, so let's just sort of uh, like create this structure, this, this graph structure and, and, and think through. So like I told you, there are nodes in this structure. Uh, so we think of these as, as representing substrings of DNA. So here, you know, T, G, 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 et cetera, here's an A, a G, et cetera. And we're gonna give them identifiers so that we can identify them precisely uh, in our graph. Uh, yep, it's worth mentioning that, you know, because DNA is double-stranded, you've got you can read a DNA sequence forwards, and you can also read, read its reverse complement. So by convention, when I'm denoting these pictures, if you walk through from left to right, uh, you read the forward strand, so C, T, C, C, et cetera. But if you walk right to left, then you read the reverse complement strand. So in this case, it would be T, T, G, G, et cetera, right? Um, and so those are the nodes. They're these, these sort of oriented substrings. Um, and then we have the edges which connect them. And it's also important to realize that because this DNA is double-stranded, it is meaningful to, to, to distinguish between connecting to the left end, as I draw it, uh, versus connecting to the right end, because it implies whether I walk through the forward or reverse complement of a sequence. So here, for example, I've got you know, two abutting substrings that um, kind of, that, that uh, enclose a SNP, right? Where I can have either an A or a G. And then over here, I have a more complex potential set of alleles, which represent a SNP nested with an indel, et cetera, right? So nodes and edges. And then finally, what's really important is to also have a notion of, of haplotypes. So we saw this in the earlier picture where I had those sort of colored, colored bands. Here's another way of representing it uh, using um, actually emoji symbols to try to uh, color and also colors to show how actual individual sequences of DNA thread through this graph. So here, for example, this one is gonna visit here, and then PD3 is gonna visit here, this sequence obviously, uh, then this allele, and then, and so forth, right? Um, so those, these paths or walks uh, in the graph 
represent the actual individual threads of DNA as they as they as they walk through uh, through through our graph. And so, if you take that nodes, edges plus set of walks that represent the underlying DNA, uh, then we have what we call uh, mathematically a variation graph. Um, it's a, a lossless encoding of a set of sequences and their alignments, as we have, have dictated. Um, and within them, we can encode, uh, so single nucleotide changes, insertions, deletions, larger structural variations, inversions. Um, you can kind of imagine how that works. You, instead of connecting to the left end, you go to, from one end to the right end and so forth. Uh, copy number variations, translocations, et cetera. And, and for people who are sort of on the CS side of things, there are, there are formats and so forth for, for dealing with this and working with this kinds of data that we have pioneered. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about in just the last 10 mi minutes actually, um, is all the progress that we've made in building out the software infrastructure, the underlying kind of uh, informatics to make all of this work so that we can move from something that's conceptually simple, like you know, a linear string, a reference string, to uh, a much more complex, uh, from a kind of uh, theory point of view, uh, structure of graph. So um, we built uh, this thing called the Variation Graph Toolkit, VG for short, Variation Graph. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna kind of walk you through some of the things that we've, we've built into it and where we're trying to go. Um, so you can check it out on GitHub, GitHub here. Um, it's at this point by far the most used uh, pan-genomic software in the field and, and growing uh, pretty rapidly. One of the things uh, for, for the sort of CS people in the audience is that we have nice underlying APIs. So one of the things that we've done recently is build out uh, uh, a standalone sequence library, we call it libvdsg, which um, you can use, you can use the Python bindings, you pip install libvdsg or C++ headers uh, and, 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 and work with that so that you can actually manipulate very large graphs and we have back, different backend implementations that suit different kinds of use cases. Further, um, you know, we've actually reconstructed a lot of the primitive operations that you need to work with this kind of structure um, from a computer science point of view. So one of the things that you're going to want to do with your with your 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 reference genome is search, right? You want to be able to say, okay, I want to know where this string or this this sequence is in in the reference. Um, and so one of the references. Uh, that such one of the indexes we've built, uh, this is Yoni Siren's work, who's a research scientist in the group, um, is GCSA2. And what it is essentially is an FM index. Um, I'm not gonna go and describe what that, that is, but essentially it's a substring index uh, that works over a graph. And so you can search any, you can, the input is any substring less than 128 bases in length. Um, and you can find an, a, a match to that substring um, using this index very, very rapidly. Um, in time proportional to the length of that substring. We also, so that's, uh, that's if you will, ungap search. We also have uh, dynamic programming uh, implementations that allow you to then, from a given uh, substring starting point, align to that graph, allowing for the, for the um, possibility of insertions and deletions. Um, and we have uh, um, hardware accelerated uh, versions of those algorithms that make this very fast. And the result is that we have a sequence, so say reads uh, from a sequencing machine to graph uh, to pan genome uh, mappers. Um, I won't uh, walk through all the details given the time, but uh, just bear in mind that these are more accurate um, than existing linear reference genomes and less biased um, in terms of their ability to map uh, than linear reference genome mappers. Um, and then relatively recently, uh, Yoni has created uh, this uh, graph uh, Burroughs Wheeler Transform Index, which is essentially a way of very, very efficiently storing very large numbers of paths uh, within a graph structure. Um, so we've gone from being able to store, you know, uh, back in the day, a few, you know, handful of paths to now being able to store 100,000 different genomes against our graph in the memory that, you know, in memory that will fit uh, in, in a modern compute node. Uh, and that allows us to do some amazing things, like for example, store uh, all of the all of the haplotypes from the Thousand Genomes project in you know about fifteen uh, gigabytes of RAM. And uh, we've also built faster. I'm going to skip through some of these details. We built much faster indexes that allow us to search uh, against these things using uh, Minimizer, which is sort of Kema-based uh, search indexes. 
And we built uh, methods for indexing so you can make distance queries. So for example, you can say, okay, I, I'm at this point in the graph here, and I'm at this point in the graph here. How far apart are these in sequence space? So how many bases of DNA would I have to traverse to get from this point to this point in any given uh, you know, plausible genome that could have arisen from this graph? Um, this was a work uh, recently done by Shen, uh, who had a really nice paper at ISMB on this subject. And um, when we combine these things together, so uh, minimizer indexing, distance indexing, uh, haplotype indexing, uh, and we rely on the observation that if we know about the presence of uh, insertion or deletion, all the, all the common insertions and deletions, then actually we no longer have to do dynamic programming um, because dynamic programming is all about gaps. Right? Or I don't, we don't need to do gaps dynamic programming, I should say. Um, and so as a result, everything just becomes a linear extension operation. And so mapping to the graph becomes ex extremely fast. Uh, and so we've written this into this mapper, giraffe, uh, which, oh, dang it, I just managed to click on, oops. Sorry about that. Can't work. Okay, um, which you can see over here, um, turns out to be extremely accurate. Essentially, it's a haplotype, it's a read to haplotype mapper. Um, and it's extremely fast. It's also, um, I don't have a slide to show it. It's extra also extreme, it's both extremely accurate. It's also extremely fast. So it's actually twice as fast as existing linear reference genome mappers, except that it's able to map to not one genome, but uh, I guess 5,000 genomes all at the same time. It's about twice as fast uh, as uh, BWA, which is by far the most commonly used uh, mapping algorithm uh, in genomics. Um, which is something we're really excited about and we're just preparing the paper on. And downstream of that, if we look uh, at how that impacts variant calling, so our ability to assay a new sample, we actually find without any tuning at all, if we just take the results, the resulting mappings and throw them into a state-of-the-art variant caller that takes mappings and tries to infer what the differences are with respect to your reference, in this case, a reference graph, um, we find that uh, it's actually res produces results that are state-of-the-art and actually more accurate uh, than have been achieved by any previous uh, mapping algorithm. These are comparable to, okay, uh, comparable to um, the absolute best results that have been achieved by the, you know, the most hand-tuned algorithms in the field. Um, we've also done a lot of work. Uh, this is John Monlong's uh, work, who's uh, a postdoc in the lab. Uh, looking at structural variant characterization. And uh, the upshot is that compared to a linear reference, we are massively better able to characterize large insertions using genome graphs. And it's just, there's no comparison. It's just vastly, vastly better. And we've written this into a pipeline that uh, allows us to assay, uh, you know, tens of thousands, uh, more than 100,000 large structural variations uh, for a new sample. And we can analyze that new sample uh, for about a dollar uh, using using the cloud, that it doesn't sound like much. You know, why worry about uh, the, the cost here? The the impact is that we actually want to be able to analyze hundreds of thousands of samples. So we're part of the um, TopMed consortium. They have 160,000 human genomes that they've uh, analyzed, and so you know, one multiplied by 150,000 is still quite a lot of money, but it's a heck of a lot better than 10 uh, times 150,000. It makes uh, reanalysis and then association studies with large structural variants actually practical for the first time. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're currently very engaged in. Um, and then I just want to finish um, by saying, actually, there are a lot, still many, many, many open problems in this space. Um, we've worked on several other mappers. We've got a new mapper that works particularly well for RNA um, and has, uh, I, I won't describe all the details, but um, essentially, it is able to factor over uncertainty in where a read might map with respect to a complex graph that allows you to do transcript and isoform uh, characterization much more accurately and at the level of an individual haplotype than anybody has achieved previously. Um, we're, we're just writing a paper on this. So there's, a, there's just a ton of stuff within VG that is um, sort of uh, computationally right at the cutting edge. So um, yeah, with that, I'm going to summarize. So um, with VG, we can generalize uh, reference genomes to pan genomes. And we've sort of built all of the infrastructure at this point to allow us to practically ma map and manipulate population cohorts uh, instead of individual references with the central intent of being able to alleviate bias, which at this point is just unacceptable if we want to move forwards uh, 
in a way that you know captured that doesn't discriminate. We cannot be in a situation in genomics where if you because you happen to be you know African American, that somehow your genetic analysis will be subpar, right? That cannot be something that is at the core of genomics, right? And it has been in the past because of the biases that we have in, in some of our references. So it's worth mentioning, by the way, that the existing reference genome is actually an admixed, uh, mostly 70%, an admixed African-American individual. So depending on which part of the genome you're looking at, you'll see sort of different biases that are present. It's not a simple story. But in general, we cannot be in a situation where, where depending on your ancestry, you may or may not get good genetic inference. And so with the Human Pangenome Project, we're really getting to the point where we can replace that reference genome structure, which is right at the core of everything we do with a true population that represents human diversity. Um, and in the future, this will be a completely open basis for the way in which we do human genomics. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank everybody um, at Santa Cruz who's involved in the project, uh, especially Adam Novak, who's engineering the lab, Eric, who started the project, who's a postdoc. He lives in Naples, but he works with us uh, all the time. Uh, Glenn, who lives in Montreal, but is uh, always working with us. Yoni, who's written all of the index structures. John, who's done all the work on the structural variant calling. Jonas, who's done tons and tons and tons of work that I haven't talked about uh, regarding RNA characterization. Shen, who's worked on the distance indexes. Uh, Jordan, who's done pretty much everything. Uh, Charlie, who's worked on uh, lots and lots of things uh, relating to undiagnosed disease characterization and uh, sort of trying to figure out what are causative variants using genome graphs. Uh, and uh, and all these folks uh, besides who have made major contributions. And then finally, I'm not gonna go through the names, but lots and lots of people who are associated with the Human Pan Genome Project who are helping us uh, gather samples and do the sequencing and so forth. So thanks. <laughs>